Welcome back, everybody, to the CPTSD podcast. I'm Tabitha Bird Weaver here with my friend and co host, Beth Pace. <laughs> we are going to be talking with a special guest here today that Beth will introduce in just a minute. But I just wanted to take a second as we're opening and say thank you for the great reviews that we're getting. They're so encouraging and it's a really validating and supportive. And so thank you. I just wanted to say um, that Be Boating Right is saying that our podcast is something that is really helpful if you're just waking up to this idea that you might have CPTSD. Um, RA from Nebraska said, wow, just wow. And that felt so good to read. Thank you for that. Um, Nicole Listens said that this is excellent information and that they are really grateful for the depth and content that we're presenting. And Twig48 let us know that it is so good that she's in therapy or they're in therapy. And this is almost a primer before they go in for their session. So I'm really grateful that you are receiving this so well. Thank you. Um, we have exciting news today, and it's an exciting topic. So, Beth, how about you introduce our guest, and uh, we'll get rolling. Thank you, Tabitha Birdweaver. Um, and if you guys uh, love the podcast, especially today, you're going to get to like enjoy the dialogue and the conversation um, between uh, three, you know, mental health professionals who care very deeply about the topic. But if you want to watch it, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch the Zoom call of three people uh, having a spicy conversation. Um, so without further ado, um, I am, as always, uh, Beth Pace. I'm a licensed professional counselor supervisor here in New Orleans, Louisiana. And we are joined, Tabitha and I are joined today by um, my treasured colleague. And I'm going to read her bio and then let her kind of speak a little bit about herself, Nikki Lee marriage and family therapist, licensed professional counselor, supervisor, CIMHP, you're probably going to have to tell us what that means, Nikki, has been a licensed mental health professional for over 15 years in Arkansas and Louisiana. She is a native New Orleanian who returned to the city post Hurricane Katrina to assist with improving the mental well-being in her community. She has earned the distinction of being a Louisiana State Board Approved LPC Supervisor advanced trained in family and divorce mediation, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, emotionally focused therapy, and certi certified integrative mental health provider. That's what it is, CIMHP, to help with nutritional wellness. Her passion is working with pre-licensed clinicians, assisting couples with enhancing their relationships, and breaking the public the stigma of seeking mental health therapy for marginalized people. Nikki's goal is to promote quality mental health services and have a lasting impact within the counseling profession by fostering positive professional relationships. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Beth and, and Tabitha, for having me. This is really, really exciting and a great topic to talk about, for sure. <laughs> and we haven't shouted out the topic yet. We're all like, this is going to be so good. All right, Nikki, like when I asked you to come and speak with us, um, what, you know, what did I sort of float in front of you? Like, did you want to talk about this? Cause I think I was like, so excited on the voicemail I left you that I was like, I probably need to write her an email too. And like, <laughs> calm it down a little bit. So yeah, if you want to kind of start, what are we here to talk about today? Yeah. So we are talking about a uh, complex PTSD in relation to intergenerational racial trauma. Um, and how it, you know, the symptomology that it presents within marginalized groups, so BIPOC populations, LGBTQIA plus individuals, um, any group that is outside of what's considered traditional norm, um, and how they are responding to the oppressive natures that or events that they're encountering from the greater populace in society. This is going to be great. <laughs> so I'm one, glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, welcome. We're so happy. Um, one of the things that Tabitha and I really regularly mention is um, if you've got any form of complex trauma, uh, perfectionism and like, uh, you know, the, the anxiety of how you are received by other people can be such a big part of that. Um, and you know, what, what we're here to do today is open a conversation and uh, I'm not perfect. 
None of us are perfect, but I think that sometimes the fear of how we are received is what's standing in the way of us having these kind of conversations. Um, and so we're here to do our best to bring this topic up and into the light. So, right, how complex post-traumatic stress can also be caused by systems, not just by families. So, so far we've been talking about like in the family, in the family, in the family. And years ago, a client of mine used the turn of phrase. She was like, well, but it's really just like concentric circles of the same thing, a power dynamic that leads people who are lower down in the power hierarchy to be suffering and be given the message that their suffering is illegitimate, um, problematic, dangerous to other people, hurtful and harmful, like all that kind of wild messaging that you may have received in your family or in your childhood, consider the fact that we're getting it from a lot of other places too. Uh, not just from family of origin or uh, extended family. So one of the things that uh, we wanted to start with, um, there are some questions we want to ask. And I think that the questions that Nikki brought are really action questions, which I love so much. And usually in the second half of our talk, we say like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Or like, what can you take away today? So if someone was like really brand new to this topic, which, uh, you know, that's kind of who we describe when we're talking about our, our ideal listener is somebody who's like, oh, whoa, this is me. Or like, oh, whoa, the problem isn't me. Um, I'm wondering if you guys want to talk or you want to start with describing a little bit about like what systemic racism is, where it comes from historically, um, and, you know, what is cultural historical trauma? So the systemic racism, cultural historical trauma, um, and since I'm like, there's three of us, I'm going to try and kind of moderate today. So Nikki, if you want to start and then Tab will hear from you and then I'll tag myself in. Sure thing. Okay. Um, so from my understanding of systemic racism, just in research and attending various workshops with different organizations that talk about this in depth, um, race is a construct. It was, it was a construct that began, you know, during slavery time or just prior to slavery time, where there was a differentiation between white and black, dark and light, essentially, um, where indentured servitude has been a part of human history for centuries, right? Uh, but indentured servitude morphed into what slavery became um, and targeting one specific ethnic group as a means of oppression. And that is how racism was born out of that. We are better than you are subservient to us and to drive that point home even further so that you know, the, the service, the indentured servants would not try to rise up and say, well, I've done this X amount of years, I'm leaving. Um, then violence, brute force was utilized in addition to the manipulation, the mental manipulation to make them believe you're subservient to us. You are less than us. We are of higher tier divine, whatever, whatever. And I mean, talking about the Royal family, you know, we're, we're, yeah. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it bore out of just a, a complete constructed construct. It's made up the fact that we look at race the way that we do. That's not to be confused with ethnicity. That's not to be confused with culture, because those things are true identifiers. If you are um, from Ghana or if you are Swedish, those are ethnicities race in and of itself is a completely created construct to, to begin building a system of hierarchy tiered and oppression. That was an amazing summary, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still like filter processing everything you said. And I, yeah. I think that you really captured the heart of it. And when I'm listening to you, if I, if I put aside the, the construct of race, it sounds exactly like an abusive relationship in which CPTSD could and would be created. 
Absolutely. Right. There's the, the, the dismissal, the invalidation, the um, my way or the highway approach. And we've really turned a group of individuals and people into a commodity. Yes. And also, I mean, I'm just feeling a little disgusted right now. So I'm going to sit with that and be with that, um, that that has occurred. But um, the violence piece can be both subtle and overt, right? Just, just letting people know that they're not able to choose to be free or choose to leave is violent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's so many different, I think, in recent years, we have looked more to the past because of the unrest or the, the really impactful dialogue that has come out of um, American leadership. Um, which I think for, for a very long time has been just under the surface, but someone pulling the lid back and saying, you can do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You don't have to worry about respecting anybody. Just speak your truth. And that truth being very, um, just nasty. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many other ways that I could categorize it, but there's, there's no other way to put it other than sheer self-centered nastiness where my way is the only way and it's the right way and anything deviating from that is wrong or dirty or you know lesser than in some sort of way um and it's it's you know there i'm so grateful that in recent years that there are more organizations museums that are setting themselves up for these types of topics and have to have to have an accuracy of the historical record of what happened um, you have the National American uh, African American Museum in, in Washington, D.C., fantastic facility in terms of all of the information that they have. And I'm sure there are museums locally that are doing similar work. Um, they just the, the one in D.C. has just curated so much information that is almost impossible to go through in a day's time. And it does elicit feelings of, you know, disgust because why, why would anyone want to be that disrespectful to any other person? Um, but, you know, what I have through my reading and research, it, it, what I've deduced is that their, their drive to have their life be a certain way is more palatable. It's, 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 I, I, I gotta have it this way. So I've got to do this not so great thing, um, you know, in order to have what I really want, which is over here. Yeah. And I mean, just speaking as a white individual, there's a whole core of us who have been brainwashed into thinking we're not racist because that's the only way we'll keep our way of life. And so there's this like terrifying existential dread that something bad is going to happen if we don't experience race as a we and them type of situation. Yeah. 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 That's very true. Beth, Beth, what do you want to put into this discussion? Y'all know I'm like bursting. I'm bursting. <laughs> I see you over there. I love it. <laughs> but also, I, as you guys know, I'm working very hard to use my listening ears and not my interrupting mouth. So <laughs> thank you. Because I'm like, okay, me too, right? Um, one of the things that I, I want to, you know, so again, like if I'm thinking about, you know, who might be listening to this, if you are someone who identifies as being in a white body and the, the you you're listening to this podcast, thank you. This is good for you. We're not trying to hurt you. This is not threatening. So one of the things we talk about a lot of the times is like, how do you soothe your nervous system to ascertain, is this really threatening or am I activated right now? And so if you're here and you're listening, thank you. Keep less listening. Let this be a practice of just like, can I, can I strengthen my capacity to tolerate distress, which is good for you. But there's this other thing that Nikki and, and Tab are talking about, which is when someone is like berating you, belittling you, really hurting you, and then going, well, if you can't tolerate this, that's on you. This is like a you thing, not like a system thing. So gaslighting and getting manipulated is super confusing. It is designed to be, it's designed to work on you where you're like head scratcher here. I thought I wasn't feeling good. And then someone else told me that like, this is the best love gets. So like, why? Okay. Well, I guess I'll try and work through my own confusion. Mm. 
So yeah. a couple of things I want to add to, um, you know, Nikki was talking about how like slavery and indentured servitude have been around for as long as human history has existed. We, um, we're still evolving and where we came from um, was a lot more of like an, an animalistic aspect. And I'm not talking about any, I'm talking about all of us. I'm talking about all of us. Homo sapiens all came out of Africa. Okay. And then when we discovered yep. the Neanderthals in like Europe and Asia, you know, what we did, we killed them. We married them. We enslaved them. And that's what happened to like our sort of like, uh, sibling to homo sapiens, like 40,000 years ago. That's what homo sapiens do. This is what we do. But the idea that we're justifying it in 2022, like it's kind of not that big of a deal, uh, is not our evolutionary best selves. We've got somewhere else that we can go folks. Um, but European imperialism, this idea that white bodies are supreme, superior, um, goes together with monotheism like peanut butter and jelly. So if you are a pantheist, meaning that you worship many different gods, like lots of cultures did over the course of like over the course of human history all over this planet, but if you believe that there's only one God, and that he's the right God, okay? You can go to a different country and justify taking their resources, crushing their culture, enslaving them, and telling yourselves that you're doing the one true God's work. And so European imperialism or white supremacy and monotheism have, it was one of the most disastrous marriages in human history because then your king or your queen, there's actually a thing um, that is still like referenced in court documentations as recently as like something like 2014, it's called the doctrine of discovery. So uh, a, like the Pope, like a couple hundred years ago was like, if you, if you go to a new country and there are people who already live there, but no, no Christian, has claimed it yet, you can say you discovered it. You can say you <laughs> discovered it. And it doesn't matter if people are already living there. That's magical thinking, folks. To say that you discovered a place that people are already living is what we would describe as magical thinking. <laughs> There's only one more thing I want to add. So when we get to the cultural historical trauma piece of this, you need to understand that like hurting people is traumatic for you too. Yes. It hurts you to hurt someone else. It's destructive. And so in order to oppress someone, you need to make them subhuman. You need to make them other than you. Because if you watch a child cry while you're beating their parent, in order to not hold what you're doing, you have to say, that you're doing that to other because otherwise you can't stay intact psychologically. And so we, yes, yeah, slavery. I mean, that's one of the things that like, uh, like Vikings and, you know, the Norse would go and do is like rape, pillage, enslave. And then the, the psychological marketing of looking at someone who looks just like you and being like, well, but you know, you're a slave. So like you're subhuman, we're not the same. Um, that's, that's gaslighting. Um, so. There's also the component of taking cultural identifiers within that entity that you're talking about and discovering, I'm air quoting, in case you're only listening to the podcast, um, taking those and incorporating them into the system that you're trying to oppress people with so that they swallow it more easily. And so, for example, um, Christmas trees aren't Christian. Neither are Easter eggs, right? But these are things that were incorporated to oppress and suppress the culture that they came from. And that's also gaslighting and also very common in families who create those of us with CPTSD. It's really kind of a narcissistic approach. Very much so. Yeah. 
And, and to your point, Beth, you mentioned about, um, you know, the, the watching a, a, uh, your parents be beat in front of their children. I mean, that's one of the violent tactics that was used during slavery times where, you know, relatives, your parents or anyone was beaten in front of you as a means of look what could happen to you relatives or families broken apart where you had different fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, you know, aunts, uncles sold. Okay. You, you want to try to run away from my plantation. I'm going to sell your, you know, I'm going to sell this, this buck, you know, they would, they would use animal terms on people to further dehumanize, you know, you've made, you know, you've made me about 25 children on my plantation, but you know, you, you're a little mouthy, you know, I can tell you look like you want to run. So I'm going to sell you to my friend who lives two States over and not let that person's family know where they're going. You don't need to know where they're going, you know, and in any, any movies that we see recently that depict slavery and especially the ones that have a sense of accuracy, um, you'll see how it's depicted of where they may be a freed black person and they will try to find, you know, I'm looking for my wife, I'm looking for my husband, I'm looking for my children because they sold them maybe four or five years ago and I was able to purchase my freedom. You know, there, there's so many different aspects of it in terms of that dehumanizing point um, to get people to, to just obey. Basically, it's it's about obeying no matter what, um, and and we're we're in some of that now because I think what slavery, even though it was abolished with the um, I don't recall which amendment, so please forgive my ignorance on that. But I know that the Thirteenth Amendment, um, what that turned into, is what we now have with the prison system. So we're back to that systemic issue where. Um, you know, it is utilized where Black people tend to be more often targeted for crimes or even suspicion of crimes. They don't even have to be doing anything illegal. But if I think you are, I can stop you. I can arrest you and put drugs on you or say, I saw you do something you didn't do. Look at all the people that have been, you know, falsely incarcerated for 40, 50 years off of a lie with no evidence. He raped me, you know, uh, Emmett Till, that situation where, you know, the lady finally came out and said, yeah, he didn't whistle at me, but this child essentially is dead and not coming back. But yet we are punitive. We're so punitive based off of race in this country, off of false information. And no one takes the time to investigate because black or marginalized groups oftentimes means guilty without necessarily having to go through due process of what this country is supposed to be built on. However, we all have to keep in mind that um, the rules, the constitution, all the things that were put in this, into place for America was never to include, or at that time, it was not to include in servitude people. It was not meant for black people in this country that were brought here, right? Against their will oftentimes. Um, it was made for white men. It wasn't even made for women. If you start to really look at some of the older uh, historical documents of laws that were created and some are still on the books. <laughs> look at Louisiana. We have some laws that are on the books 200 years old and they're still on the books, you know? So we, we, we have a lot of work to do, I think, as, as a community, not just in the mental health industry, but just in general to really learn accuracy of the historical records so that we can take action that is appropriate and helpful um, to those of us who are experiencing difficulty around these topics. You know, the hypo arousal, the hyper arousal that can come about when you are bombarded with images, whether it be on the news, whether it be in the newspaper, whether it be on social media, which is heavy, heavy, where, you know, watch this video of Ahmaud Arbery get, you know, targeted and, and shot, you know, or George Floyd, you know, somebody kneeling on his neck for eight minutes and 43 seconds. You know, it's, it's, it's constant. And I can name so many names, but until we start to really look at the systems at large to really and have these conversations where we're putting 
everything out on the table to really address it accurately, we're not going to get very far. We keep hiding behind things. There's a, there's a quote that someone read to me not too recently um, that was, if the truth hurts you, don't blame the truth. Blame the lie that kept you comfortable. Like the truth is not the problem here, folks. The truth is what's going to set us all free together. So as we've talked about that idea of like, you wake up and go, oh, whoa, my family was dysfunctional. And here I thought this whole time the problem was me. Um, And we, as, as it was suspected, we have a lot to talk about and a lot to share. Um, And so I'm going to, I'm going to jump into uh, one of the next like topics, which is like America, quote unquote, American culture. And I want to go ahead and say, first and foremost, folks, whiteness is not culture to have to be to be called white means that someone has taken your own rich cultural history away from you. Maybe you're Polish or maybe you are European and German. Maybe European, excuse me, you're English and German, maybe you're Irish, um, and maybe you have like 1% Neanderthal DNA. I do, which is so cool. But what does that mean about like my my Neanderthal ancestors? They got absorbed into Homo sapiens. They didn't get to like sort of meet and then coexist peacefully. So as it relates to like how I try to describe myself today, I would call myself European American because I think that whiteness is like a thief of like my authentic life and experience. And so kind of talking about that and making some space for that, you know, what is American culture? What, uh, what is it not? You know, Nikki kind of said that already, like, is this the land of the free? I don't know. I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, but also can we talk about kind of like capitalism as well when we're talking about quote unquote America? Um, and so what are, what are you guys thoughts on that? Hmm. Nikki, would you like to go? I I could, but, um, yeah, you, you tell me Tabitha, what you have. (laughs) <laughs> I, um, well, I have Welsh and Irish descent. And so that is something that I have been embracing lately and understanding um, how to feel that differently. Because in my experience as a white female, cis female, um, and I think this might be generalizable, but I'm not sure. My experience of America is consumerism, period. I am bombarded all the time with how I'm not enough. And here's something I can sell you that will help you be enough. And if you can't be enough, you can at least fake it, right? It's exhausting. Um, Also, I just to disclose a little bit, as we talked about, um, I live in Oregon. We are one of the whitest states in the United States. We, I wasn't here when this happened, just saying, Um, but we started off as a no black state and we can absolutely feel that today. I don't know if either of you would fall, have followed recently Newburgh, uh, this town where I live, has had a school board explosion. We um, had some members say that uh, school district, our school district could not post any type of symbolism for Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ. Just not, we're not going to do it. We, we took away the right for them to have safe places for our students and have teachers who are identifiable to students who need that extra support. And there's been a really big explosion here from those of us who disagree. Um, and I'm really sad to say we lost a recall to change that. And I'm like, how do I get out of this town? But I can't because I want to stay here and change this town, if that makes sense. <laughs> It does. So I guess to wrap up that, thank you, to wrap up that rambling piece, I think that we are all functioning from a place of not being enough. And one of the things that keeps racism intact is that we can at least be more than you or them or wherever our focus is going. And so um, I feel sad about that. And I feel like I'm mourning 
what I thought was in existence. So I'm very grateful for the change. What do you think about that, Nikki? Or, uh, or your own thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Oregon, I don't think I've ever visited Oregon, but it is a place that I would like to visit just because of how I've, I've, I've read about and seen pictures of like nature landscaping and how beautiful it is. But then you have like um, portrayals of, of Oregon with shows like Portlandia, where you, you kind of see, um, they find humor in some of the uh, culturalism within that state, right? So I you know, think that's really disappointing that you have groups within your, your town, your, your state that are essentially silencing different movements that, that are important to acknowledge because I'm sure there are black people there. They're just not in large numbers. Um, but how would they feel to hear that type of rhetoric, you know? Um, and so to back to your question about, you know, America and, and capitalism and what we, I agree with Tabitha of it being heavily consumer-based. Um, those are the things that drive capitalism is we want your money. You make it, we want it back in different ways, right? Um, and so from my standpoint, born and raised in Louisiana and, and pretty much my entire life has been lived in, in South US, um, the Southern states. Um, while consumerism is, is obviously a big point and, and that, that conversation of you are not enough, I've always had to deal with it from also the racial component as well. Um, because my skin is lighter in complexion than um, Black people or what people as a, as a general rule will say, oh, are you Black? Yes, I am. Um, both of my parents are, but we have, you know, lighter shades of Black, right? Uh, we still identify as such as African-American descendants, but yes, we have other uh, cultures or, or ethnicities within our, our family, whether it's French, English, you know, Scottish, we have those part of us and, and as well as uh, Hispanic as well. So I say all that to say um, that idea of you're not enough being a part of the consumerism rhetoric in this country, we worked very hard or my family culture was very um, encouraging from the standpoint of educate yourself, learn, be able to speak properly so that you can be in spaces they will allow you in spaces. You don't want to be a person that can, um, that presents uneducated. So going to school, reading books, learning history was incredibly important in my family. And for some black people in this country, that is, that is their idea or their way out of um, that oppressive positioning, even though I'm still oppressed, there are oftentimes, even though I am incredibly educated, where I have been in spaces of leadership. And if I am direct in my speaking or speech about a topic, I'm deemed as the angry Black woman. I've had a white um, business owner who I was working with at a point in time in my career tell me that in a meeting, you know, <laughs> whoa 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 you know the gestures the hand motions of whoa 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 you know no need to be angry black woman and it's like I'm not I'm not angry at all but I am being very direct about something that needs to be accomplished for the greater good of what we all are working toward here and so I think a lot of black people that idea of you're not enough um we do our best to in 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 many ways conform as a means of safety, as a means of survival. Um, and just before we were talking, um, in doing family history of, of my family, you know, I have relatives of two generations back. So my grandmother's aunts who wanted to, pass, well, not wanted to, they did. They passed for white women and separated themselves from the family as a means of survival. So you have different um, ways in which Black people, people of various cultures and ethnicities, if they can appear a certain way, um, they use that to their advantage to survive. And, and it's not just, I'm not enough. I'm going to do what I can to assimilate so that I'm not bothered. 
And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting mentality and dynamic. I can understand it on one hand and on the other hand, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't, I don't know if I would have done that, but I can't say that concretely because I wasn't living in that time where segregation and, and highly oppressive measures were, were present, where you can easily be dragged off and, and disappeared for anything, really. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time, out of here. Well, where's, where's, where's Joan? I don't know. I haven't seen Joan in two days. So well, that's very strange. And you never hear from Joan again. So it's, um, America's is, you know, it, it is a mod podge. There's so many different cultures here and ethnicities because they hear about, you know, the, the American dream, I think in other countries and, and they come here to try to actualize that. And, I'm starting to learn more and more now as social media has been and the internet has opened up the world more. Uh, a lot of our ways based on capitalism and consumerism, we're not as good as we think we are, you know, in terms of, you know, medical costs, healthcare costs, education costs. Um, you know, I know of some colleagues that have gone to, you know, Oxford just because, hey, I can get a free education over here as opposed to having to go into thousands of dollars of debt in America. And I'm like, you know, I understand. <laughs> I understand completely. Beth, I see that got you. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> you know that it did. Well, yes. yeah, we, we, which is to say uh, the, the quote unquote United States, um, we are known throughout the world of having that system, the educational system, look in a lot of ways like indentured servitude. You want to go to graduate school without getting going thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into debt? How about you work for us for free in abusive systems where someone can essentially own you, tell you what to do and like teach their classes and you're not getting paid any money. You're getting the stipend and um yeah, we are known. We are notorious. Um, so a couple of things that I just want to like also add in, because because Tabitha made the point that like if you are getting sold the message that um, you have something to lose if other people experience their own personal power and they experience um, like equality in the systems that exist in this country, um, that's a story too. So one of the things that is perpetuating white supremacy is the people that actually that, that benefit from it are like way up at the tippy top folks. I don't benefit from white supremacy, excuse me. I experience white privilege to be fair, but that also isn't good for me either because it makes me think that I've got, I, I, there's an ease through which that I move through this world, which doesn't belong to me. It belongs to everybody. It isn't mine, it's everybody's. And so it should be. Um, so one of the other things that kind of perpetuates white supremacy, again, this, this highly benefits people up at the top, not necessarily everybody else, is if you're poor and white and somebody says to you, you know what, you're pretty lucky. Aren't you lucky? Think about who you are better than and think about how you're like us. You don't get, there's no invitation to this club. You don't get to come to this club. But just as a reminder, like think how lucky you are and like think about, so privilege is also something that keeps people asleep. Um, and that's not really doing anybody a service. Um, so again, you know, if I want to bring this back as a point of reference, I'm, am I making you laugh or do you have something to say? I do. I'm not laughing at you, Beth. It's, 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 it's refreshing to hear other people's perspective to see what's happening and be more um, focused on it. Like I can acknowledge that this is happening. I'm, I'm, I have two eyes and I can see it. Um, you know, it makes me think of an old conversation or quote from Donald Trump in like the early nineties where, you know, if I can make poor white people believe that they're better than the richest black person, I can be easily in the Republican party and win. And he did exactly that. But what I wanted to add to that, just in America and how the systemic, racial, oppressive nature is, is here to only benefit a select few, um, you have had people 
from marginalized groups rise to attention and rise to a point of power, but have been cut down by government agencies because their message was more about socioeconomic than race. For example, you have, you know, there are certain white groups that love to quote, misquote, I'll say Martin Luther King. If you really start to read more than just his popularized speeches and his actual readings, like letters from Birmingham, that that tells more of who he was and what he was about. Yes, he was about racial equality and equity, but once he started talking about socioeconomic, because the reason he was in Memphis was to deal with a, a uh, labor strike for garbage workers who were fighting for fair wages. And you start talking about money, I gotta shut you up. Fred Hampton, who you know in Chicago was doing a lot of speeches and talking and uniting people in different groups of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds white, black, Indian, Asian, Hispanic, he was getting everybody's attention. What was he talking about? The oppressive system and how it was keeping us economically oppressed, not just racially oppressed. And what did they do? The FBI sent in the Chicago Police Department and basically shot up his apartment while he slept in the early morning hours of December 4th, 1969. Malcolm X, even though Nation of Islam, I'm sure does not get you know, they're not well liked in a lot of ways, but he was beginning to open his eyes a little bit more by traveling the world and seeing how other Muslims were conducting themselves and seeing this is more of an economic thing. The, the nation of Islam is not treating us well financially. And once you start asking financial questions, the heads that are that select few that Beth was talking about, I got to shut you up because we got to keep the status quo. You being in servitude to us for no money, graduate students, you know, teaching classes and doing all these internships for no money. We have to keep you silent because I need you here in order to keep our capitalistic system together because we really don't have the money that we say we do. Everything's valued, estimated as, and it's like, well, what's the hard cash? What's, what's the liquidity? I'm sure a lot of these companies, Amazon, don't have it. <laughs> it's a concept is my point. And so how race and, and, and complex trauma, and we're all traumatized in various ways, just to bring it back to the, to the overall topic. Race is what we see because we see skin color before we see anything else. We stereotype based on what we see. And I mean, I've been guilty of it too. It comes from, at, at, at times, my point of view doesn't necessarily come from a malicious place, but there are people that are malicious based on what they see. And walking that back as often as you can to look at it and say, you know what? Yes, I may see this Asian person or Hispanic person or Black person, white person, but how are they really different from me other than what I see? They're not rich. They're not walking around Kim Kardashian, Jeff Bezos, because you have these groups that will co-opt other cultures for their financial gain. And that's why bringing up the Kardashians, that's what they do. They love to insert themselves into black culture, selling, you know, these tan, you know, bronzers for your skin and all this. And I'm just like, it's OK to be yourself. You don't have to be anybody else because there's no one else like you. You know, and, and for those that are dealing with trauma, dealing with post-traumatic stress and how complex it is, you know, your unique self is, is great just as you are. And, and striking that message as often as possible for every single person that walks this earth, that's how one of the ways that we can unite and have more of these conversations without it being malicious or I'm trying to put you down or disrespect you. If we, if we hold respect in a high regard, we can talk about these things really formally organized well, like the Fred Hamptons, like the Malcolm X's, like the Martin Luther King's of our past and really affect systemic change on a larger level. And there's one more thing I want to jump in and say about capitalism. Thank you for all of that, Nikki. Um, I, I wanted to make space in case there was like something I said that you were like, can I, can I run you in on something? And I would have been like, I'm ready for this. I can handle it. Um, there's one more thing I want to say about capitalism, which is like, as a reminder for all of you guys, um, that central group of power 
doesn't exist for us. There is no invitation to that party. Okay. Um, that's one of the things I learned in my multicultural counseling class that was taught to me by a black man, Zaris Watson. It was delightful because he was like, look, the whole way that the central group of power stays in power is by keeping everybody else who's on the periphery separate from each other. Because if we all actually got together and went like, oh, yeah, that's happening for you, too. Oh, you're suffering like that, too. Oh, 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 that like we would have more than enough force energy um, to sort of like dismantle those systems. But as long as we're separate from each other and like I'm fighting against you like crabs in a barrel to try and get out. There's no way to get there, because the other thing is the central group of power is who is controlling the messages that you get about other people. So, so just like capitalism brought to you by shame, sponsored by shame. <laughs> so one of the greatest things you can ever do to kind of like break that pattern for yourself, treat your shame, yeah. treat your shame. That's right. I'm hand upping because I want to say just on a personal note. Um, I was really nervous about this conversation because I feel like this is an area where I'm undereducated. And, and I'm, I'm pretty educated comparatively, but still not enough, right? I, um, I just had this sense of dread that I was going to say or do something that would be ridiculous. And I realized that the thing I needed to treat wasn't even my shame. It was my fear that I was going to present myself like one of my caregivers did. Right. Um, I grew up hearing ethnic slurs, ethnic jokes. And every time, I mean, I started saying, stop saying those when I was about 12, <laughs> you know, that did not happen. I really, I had to go through and I used advanced integrative therapy, which is something we've talked about here many times to get my dad's shame off of me so that I could be here. And so if you feel challenged by this conversation, especially if you're in a white or you're a Western European body, if you feel challenged, take a breath and recognize there's not blame here. It's not going to help. So treat that piece. Find a therapist. Connect with some education. That could help you out. Um, so I'm so glad I took that step to treat that because I feel like I can authentically be here. And um, just like you were saying, Nikki, and I'm okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm Thank glad you brought that up, Tab, because one of the things that we, uh, that was like one of Nikki's topics for discussion um, was how do we have more respectful conversations about race and oppression while minimizing white fragility's tendencies? Um, and so that question, uh, we can, I, I think it might be a great place to, to pick up. The last thing I want to say about treating your shame is if you treat your shame or you treat any sort of like energetic hooks or like neural pathways that someone could use, um, it's going to be harder for people to tone police you like Nikki was just talking about. Cause if somebody's like you, uh, you're really coming off as like an angry black woman right now. And that's making me feel uncomfortable. So we need you to go ahead and stop that. And you can be like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just telling you what I need and there's nothing inappropriate in asking for that. And then someone has to go. Uh, so usually what happens and listen, I am not inferring like you do know how. And when I'm, and when I say you, I mean, you, whoever's listening, you do know how to assess situations that are dangerous. And if you're in one, no one is, is inviting you to put yourself in more danger. We have a threat response because we need it. If you're in one of those places where it's about survival, you just got to make it through. Yeah. So no one is trying to say, um, stand up more if you're in danger. But if you are in one of those places where there's a, um, the other nice thing about hierarchy is that like people should have reporting bodies, even small business owners. Like, I don't know, maybe there, maybe there is like a, um, a, a hotline for racists in the Better Business Bureau. And you could be like, boop, 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 boop. Hey, um, do you think it's cool that this person called me an angry black woman or to like, should we do something about that? <laughs> Where's that hotline? I need that 800 number. Um, but so to come into like what Tab just brought up is, you know, how do we have 
more respectful conversations about race and about systemic oppression while minimizing that tendency of like white frailty, white fragility. Um, what are you guys' thoughts about that? Nikki, I can I can lead us if you'd want, because, you know, just my perspective, um, one of the best things that I have learned over time is to simply listen and not feel compelled to add, not feel compelled to fix, right? And if you do feel compelled, take a breath and kind of like suppress that in yourself. Just listen, because we might actually learn something if we can authentically connect. And authentically connecting feels good to most of us. It's a little scary when you're starting to heal from CPTSD because we don't always know what that's about, but listening will also help you learn that skill. So if um, I guess my basic advice to any of us who are, look like me is be more quiet, open your ears, and then respond in the best way possible. And I'm guessing whoever you're speaking with will guide you on what is the best way possible. Yeah, and I'll add to that, Tad. That's really powerful to, to listen more um, and, and not to be confused with silencing oneself because your input is valid, right? You have something to say, but I think in, before your input is, is offered, after listening, finding relatable points just because you are dealing with someone from a different culture or ethnic group, understand that the human condition is one that is universal. And if you have that basic understanding and, and start to believe that more and embody that more, the ideas and principles that, that society has pushed race in our faces to be this hierarchy will start to fade away. And we'll really see people as people. That's one thing that my grandmother, even though she grew up, you know, in South Louisiana, you know, segregation, Jim Crow, all the oppressive natures and, and ended up moving away from the South to New York because she needed opportunity for work. Um, but she's still a person, even as a Black woman, that really promotes seeing people as people as opposed to treating anyone differently. I mean, she's been through some really awful circumstances and she's an avid sports, uh, football and sports watcher. So she talks about how she used to argue with her coworkers about uh, football having black quarterbacks because they had this, you know, white guys having this whole macho, you know, black men don't know how to run a football team kind of thing. They can't lead a team. And she's like, why can't they? They're, they're, they're a human being just like anybody else. And everybody might not have the skill, but there are some that do, but you can't count them out just because they're black. And she would have these arguments because she really stood on the principle of humanism. And I, I admire that about her to come from all the things that she's come from and endured and put those things forward to say, if you find something that is relatable to another person that you're talking with, that doesn't mean you'll relate to everyone, but you find points of relatability, then you can add your input after you've listened and really hear what's being said. And because imagine if you were to see your loved one coming out of a store, being, a, being accosted by the police, they haven't done anything that you can see and that, and okay, the police is arresting and they're doing their job. But in the process of that arrest, you are watching the meal on your loved one's neck. Take race out of it. How would you respond to that? That would be gut-wrenching. And as a human, it was still gut-wrenching for me to watch that. And I have no idea who he was. I have no idea who the cop is who did it or the cops that stood by and let it happen and didn't try to, hey, man, ease up, you know, something, because that's not a part of protocol, right? There's some other elements at play. We don't know what those elements are. We do. But let's just play that role of let's just gather information. The relatability after listening, I think, is a huge component that can help us bridge that gap of having more dialogue that is respectful that is insightful and that fosters um, ideas of how we can move forward effectively. I'm having such a good time today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, a couple of the things I wanna add, um, 
when we talk about white fragility or we talk about this kind of frailty, what we're talking about is like a deficit of resilience. You know who has to talk about race all the time? People who inhabit bodies of culture and bodies of color. And if you haven't had to talk about race all the time, that's also a part of your privilege. It means that it isn't a life or death situation for you or your kids on a daily basis. Like how many women I've, I've heard described to me having to have like the talk with their boys, meaning like, okay, if you are a boy in a body of color, now I have to talk to you about what it's like to interact with the police, right? Um, and if you've never, if you didn't have to have that conversation with your child, um, that's a privilege. It's a privilege. Um, so the other thing I want to reflect, and this is like, when we talk about, uh, Tab Tabitha will say regularly, you can be the cycle breaker. You can be the cycle breaker. So if you grew up in a household where someone was expecting you to do unpaid emotional labor for them, make them feel good, uh, brighten up their day if they had the blues, or they got to take their anger out on you uh, because you were not powerful, and powerful enough in that system, let me invite you to be a cycle breaker in not asking other people to do unpaid emotional labor for you. And what I mean by that is if you've got friends who are in bodies of color or bodies of culture and you go, I'm not like that, right? I'm one of the good ones, right? Can you make me feel good, please? Please don't make me feel bad. That's asking that person to hold space for you in a sort of unpaid capacity. It is not their job. You can get a therapist. You can get a therapist who you pay by the hour or your insurance bills to be like, it's not me, right? And they can be like, well, let's talk about, you know, what's in your realm of control, what's not in your realm of control. And uh, one of the things that's also on, on the questions that was up for discussion is like, how do we uh, also approach this in the mental health industry? And if you are someone who works in any way, in any capacity with other people, uh, my encouragement is keep doing your own work because then the less fear you have, right? Like I know Nikki, Nikki's not scary. If I said something that was way off, she would gently like pull me back in, right? So that's the whole thing. Some people are dangerous folks. That's fair to say, but ethnic groups as a group are not dangerous. That is not, that is a, an overgeneralization that is not true. So to, to what Nikki was talking about, this idea, um, there's a particular type of couples therapy and Nikki does more marriage and family stuff than me, but that's called imago therapy. And the whole point of doing it is you say how you feel, you stick with like I language, how I feel, my experience. And then at the end, the bid for the other person is when you say, can you imagine what that's like? And you're not asking them to imagine your experience. You're asking them to imagine what it feels like to feel lonely, isolated, overwhelmed, burnt out. And we all know how to do that. So like, if you're not watching the video, Nikki's nodding her head, Tab is nodding her head. Like we're all like, yeah, of course. Of course, we all know what that feels like. When we meet each other on an emotional level, understanding is a lot more available. And I, um, that colleague of mine that I was talking about before we started recording, Spirit McIntyre, they are they are very gentle. And when, when they were, we were kind of interviewing each other, I was like, will you come speak to my students this summer? And they were like, yes, I will. And then at some point I was like, you know, example for like, what are your preferred pronouns? And spirit was like, not preferred Beth. Um, it's not an option for people who are trans to have like to that their gender expression is theirs. They don't, it isn't a, it's not a preference. And I was like, thank you. Um, and then at some point I was talking about the resiliency, right? So the other thing that comes with like centuries into millennia of oppression is you become extraordinarily resilient. European bodies in the United States are waking up right now. And it's essentially like um, having your skin turned inside out and having somebody squeeze lemon juice all over it. It hurts guys, it's okay. And so what I was saying to spirit was like, you know, um, 
the, the power and the resilience and what they came back and said, you know what, a lot of trans and black bodies wish that it was safe enough for them to just be able to show up tender. And I was like, yeah. Powerful. That it, 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 it's, it shouldn't, it, there shouldn't have to be this like, but you're so tough now. Um, Cause then that goes into the, the rhetoric of like strong black woman. We yeah. got angry black woman, we've got strong black woman. And then we've got the image of the Mamie, which is not as prevalent now, but I think companies are starting to wise up to that because I think uh, Aunt Jemima has removed that visual off of their, their products. Um, and, and it helps, it helps because, you know, the resiliency piece, you'll hear, if you, if you listen to Black people talk about that concept, they'll say, I'm tired of having to be resilient. Yeah, I know I have been that, but I'm, just, I'm tired of this. Can we stop this to where I have to be? Um, and someone said it once recently, and I was like, you know what? I feel that very deeply, you know, and, and it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily have to be unique to black people necessarily. That can be just for relatability purposes. If you're a woman that's constantly passed over where they're, you're in an industry where men are, are promoted over you, even though you know their job better than they do. And you have to teach them, you know, okay, we're going to hire this supervisor to work over you, even though you applied for this position, you didn't get it. We didn't give you much feedback as to why, but we hired this man over you. And now you have to teach him his job and do your own and then ultimately do his too. So you're still in the servitude position. <laughs> and, um, and like gas him up all the time, like make him feel yeah. good. Don't forget that unpaid emotional labor aspect of like, and right. don't make him feel insecure. And if he does make, feel insecure, make him feel good. Cattle coddle him he's got to feel great you know of of the role that he's in so that that whole piece and that's I only give that as an example as a relatability point for people that may not understand what it's like to be black in America which is fine understanding that um you know we have to find relatable points in order to truly understand each other you don't have to have my exact experience to have an idea of what it feels like I've got a I've got a friend who is a civil rights lawyer and he was helping the city he was helping people in Baton Rouge sue like he so he's about suing large systems so like suing the Baton Rouge police department for their response to peaceful protests in um you know 2014 and and on and uh he asked this woman this this activist this black woman he was like what do you want to come out of this lawsuit and what she said, and this is like so tender to me, she was like, I just wish there was a place for white men to be able to process what they're going through and get the support that they actually need. <laughs> I was like, God bless her. Because when you are afraid and you're powerful, you are dangerous. When you're oh, yeah. afraid and you are powerful, you are dangerous. When you are empowered and you have a power service position, you are, you, you want other people to step into their power too. Right. Um, so we, um, I almost was about to be like, are we going to make this into a part two? We might need to, but let's like, let's hit what we, <laughs> let's hit what we said we were going to talk about today. Um, because one of the things that we do on this podcast also is like, what are some actionable steps, like takeaways you, you can take with you today um, and so the question to these, these two questions, and maybe we need to break them up. Number one is how can we effectively dismantle racially oppressive systems in this country? And the other one is what is needed to properly address intergenerational trauma in the mental health industry? You're welcome to tackle both one, the other, but like salient takeaways for someone today, if they're like, Thanks a lot, Tab, Beth, and Nikki. Now I feel bad. Well, welcome. We love you. And uh, you are not powerless. You are not helpless. There's a lot you can do. And that's also why we're here. Complex post-traumatic stress can come out of being 
oppressed by big systems. And that doesn't have to be the end of the story. So whoever wants to start and then the next of you can go and then I'll wrap it up. All right, well, I'll jump in. Um, one thing that I think is really important for more people to do, and I'm saying people regardless of your background, is to get information through organizations that are um, geared toward this specific topic that are um, accurate in the information that they present. One fantastic organization that I love, 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 love is an organization by the name of Overcoming Racism. They do workshops for people, for companies, for schools. They do evaluations to see how your organization is doing with culture, diversity, and inclusion. Um, just to kind of let you know, these are some points that you can work around, improve upon. But the workshops that they offer are incredibly, incredibly important. They are very helpful in terms of giving you historical record, the whys of things, looking in depth as to how our system has been created. Um, visiting the National African American Museum in Washington, DC, that is a fantastic destination. There's so much information, so much uh, content to learn and, and, and to consume. Um, and if you can't get to Washington, D.C., if you aren't able to, you know, join a workshop with Overcoming Racism, look locally where you are. I guarantee you where you are located, there is some museum, there is some organization in your general area that is doing the work as far as um, giving historical information about race, about other cultures. And it's not that you have to just study black culture. You can study you know, Native American culture, indigenous people. There's so many different reservations. There's so many different um, Indian tribes that you know, have a huge impact on this country. You think about some of the names of cities and states in this country that are Native American. And we don't know it. We don't realize how ingrained their culture is within ours, but it has been co-opted, right? So arming yourself with information, I think is the best, one of the best ways to begin that action point of what we can do. Because the more you know on the front end or as you start to take some actions to improve upon things overall, you're gonna be or have struggle or difficulty in taking the proper action if you are misinformed. And that's how a lot of the things we've seen in the last, let's say, eight years have come to fruition because of so much misinformation being spread about as if it is the truth, as if it is accurate when it is not. So consider the source and arm yourself with as much accurate information as you possibly can. That's brilliant, Nikki. And um, out here in Oregon, we absolutely have co-opted Native American names. I, most people can't pronounce things out here without a little bit of guidance and experience. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's funny to listen to people try just a little Oregonian uh, humor there. I have a suspicion that the way we're going to dismantle racism that involves the mental health field is person by person and bottom up because people who have power really do not want to give that power away. I think, I mean, if we look at our political system, we're seeing more and more inclusion. It's not anywhere near enough, but I'm glad we're on that road, right? But coming back to you, our listener who probably has CPTSD is discovering you have that or is part of a family system where that could have happened to you recognizing that it's okay for you to have a different opinion from your family is really important. Recognizing that it's okay for you to figure out who is safe to be empathetic with and who isn't is really important. And if I was going to recommend one book that really reshaped my thinking around this, it would be My First White Friend by Patricia Raybon. I just feel like it's a easily digested um, story and, and accounting of, of her experience. So 
that might be a place for you to get educated. If you cannot handle the idea of delving into race right now, keep healing yourself because the more you do that, the more you will have the capacity to absorb the information that Nikki's talking about, take the actions that we're all talking about, and you can really make a big difference. If nothing else, you might vote differently. Beth, do you have any thoughts? I'd like to just remind everyone who's listening if you are uh, assigned female at birth or you describe yourself as like being socialized female, I'd like to remind you that it was a scant 102 years ago that we didn't even have the right to vote. So I am like speaking this into the universe. It is my, uh, it is my most tender and perhaps in some ways radical hope that we're making a shift right now from a patriarchal culture to a more matriarchal culture as women are like flooding the workforce, earning more money, parenting and raising up kids that we're moving into this idea of like tenderness is power. Empathy is power. Um, Crushing someone under your boot heel is not the only way to be powerful. Hallelujah. Um, So how can we effectively dismantle racially oppressive systems in this country? Name it. Name it when you see it. Thanks to social media, you know, there are people who are up in arms and have got some hurt feelings about quote unquote cancel culture. Can we not just call it consequence culture? That if you act wild, people are going to hold you accountable for that. If you're a small business owner and you make a massive misstep um, or you're like um, talking reckless to put it, to use the vernacular that like, it's okay to have consequences for your behavior, guys. It helps you grow. That's all right. You're going to be okay. Um, So you can name it. You can complain about it. Um, If you are a consumer, that's the thing about capitalism, guys, your power is in your dollars. Uh, there's a really great, uh, and I, I'm not going to be able to think of like the name of the show immediately off the top of my head, Killer Mike, who is a rapper um, and is a brilliant man and social activist, uh, has a TV series on Netflix. And in the very first one, he tries to spend a week spending his money only on black owned businesses. And it's hard for him to do. It's like a challenge to get all of his needs met. But the, the idea behind it is like, if you know where your money's going, you do know how to fight with that dollar, okay? Um, if you are someone who inhabits a white European body, where are the spaces where, where are the spaces where you can do your own healing without asking somebody to do unpaid emotional labor for you? Um, across the country, something called Showing Up for Racial Justice, and it is a organization for white bodies. In New Orleans, the chapter is European Dissent, D-I-S-S-E-N-T. Like, it's okay to fight this, like, this story and this patterning. So go to a place where someone's like, I hear you, I've been there, waking up is really hard, instead of going to a space where you're like, please don't make me feel bad. I'm one of the good ones, right? And people be like, We can't do that. It's exhausting. Um, Treat as, as Tabitha already said, you can treat your own trauma, which gives you a greater capacity to soothe your nervous system, to know when something is really dangerous or when you are activated in a trauma response. It's good to be able to have that discernment. Um, And a, I'd like, I've, I've been taking notes this whole time. So I'm just like looking at all the things on my paper. Uh, Resma Menachem wrote this really beautiful book called My Grandmother's Hands. And he talks about the somatic experience of trauma stored in your body. And he's talking about bodies of culture, which is what he calls uh, people of other ethnicities, because the idea here is that white supremacy is not a culture. It's not culture. Um, and he, his, his Institute for Somatic Abolitionism is a place where you can go and get more information about like freeing your own body from intergenerational and racial trauma. Um, He's on, and like, hopefully we can get Brent, our golden God, who is our editor to figure out how to put some of these links down in the show notes page. This is like, shout out Brent. I could also email him. Um, That there's 
uh, he, he goes on the on being podcast, I think in like early 2020 and he and Krista Tippett, who is a white woman sit and talk about like what it, how the discomfort of talking about race. And she's like, this is hard on me. And he's like, yes, now sit with it. It's great. And she's like game. So she's like, okay, I'm down. This is, and he's like, did you see the way that you just flinched when I asked you this question? It's so great. Cause like it's tender, but it's accountable. It's really beautiful. Um, for, and so say, for example, you go to a park and there's not enough about like the land, uh, like whose land it was, the indigenous people, um, you can put that on the comment card. Fountain Blue State Park, which is on the other side of Lake Pontchartrain for us in New Orleans. The, I went there in 2017 and it's a sugar plantation and it's talking about like the guy who owned it and how he like kind of had a gambling problem um, and this and that. And it's all these like funny quips on little plaques around the park. And there wasn't anything about the slave labor that made the money from the sugar plantation. So I start looking up on my phone, the records of the, the bodies and the human beings who were bought and sold and lived there. And when I, when they were like, any comments or thoughts on like what you think we could do to improve the park? And I was like, yes, I do have some of those. <laughs> this is a problem. Like they're, you're erasing a part of this history and then saying like, so where did your boy's money for the gambling problem come from? Slave labor folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if all of this feels really overwhelming, that's okay. Um, there are a couple of fiction things you could consume Passing is a movie on Netflix right now that Tessa Thompson yeah. is in about, I believe it's yeah. like a cousin or a friend from her childhood that's white passing. Um, yeah. You could watch that. You could read the book Kindred by Octavia Butler. It's beautiful. Um, you could read The Water Dancer by ta Coates. That is, it's like, like science fiction. Um, it's it like sort of science fiction fantasy. It's it's beautiful. Um, or if you want to just look up Tupac's auntie, Asada Shakur, and just find out kind of what happens to black bodies when they try to stand up to power. Um, these are all like the internet is a gift for you. You do not have to use it to scroll through Instagram and be sold things. You can right. get information. Um, what a treat. What a good time. Um, if there's anything you guys want to kind of wrap up with, like one more kind of takeaway or one more like word of encouragement to anybody who's listening to this, um, what would be one of some of the last things you wanted to share? And then we'll, we'll wrap it up today. I can go, um, if you don't mind, Tabitha, since this is you and Beth's show, um, I guess, um, I think, we talked about a lot of different ideas and, and you're right, it is intense. And I think the, the one thing that I would leave people with in their journeys to find emotional wellness, find comfort, find spaces for themselves, for just peace overall with just the, the, life, the lives that we have. Um, it's an old African proverb that is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And building community for yourself is one of the strongest and most powerful things that you can do. That was a beautiful quote. Thank you for bringing that into this time. And um, building community is absolutely maybe the best thing that you can do. Research shows us time and time again that more important than diet, exercise, even therapy is having a strong community around you. And if you are awakening to the fact that you have CPTSD or you already know and you've been working on it, you already know that you need a new community in order to change the pattern that's been running your life so that you can have that empowerment. If you are more advanced in your healing through CPTSD um, and you've taken some of the, the big steps already, or I know that we have a couple of clinicians who listen to this podcast, which is totally humbling and awesome. Um, I would encourage you to confront your racial bias directly in therapy. Um, advanced integrative therapy has a whole protocol 
on how to do that. And I'll tell you, I went through it just two times and it was pretty amazing. Um, I really got some insight into my reactivity. And so please keep healing. That would be my takeaway. How about you, Beth? Thank you for asking. Um, there is um, the true origins protocol in AIT includes the two following, which I think are extremely salient to the conversation we're having. Ancestral true origins, cultural historical true origins. And the cultural historical true origins the, on, those, on that list is like slavery, torture in the culture, gender bias. And so if you inhabit a European body and someone has been telling you that you're American, but everybody else that lives in this country is like African-American, Asian-American, then where is your uh, continental qualifier before <laughs> the word American? And I'm not making fun of you, go find that out. Where are you from? What do you call, what culture can you name that belongs to you that gets erased when we're being sort of absorbed into this like conglomerate of, of like white whiteness. Um, and I might've lost my train of thought. We'll see if it comes back. Um, Tab said, treat your own bias. And I will say that if there is nothing more that you feel like you can do today or any day, the one thing I would say is continue to work on your own self-compassion practice. Because if you have a self-compassion practice, someone can tell you you made a mistake and you don't disintegrate. Someone can tell you that they don't agree with you or that they've got another perspective on your circumstances and you can handle it. Is it comfortable? No, but it helps you grow. You can make it. We believe in you. And if you want to hear more on like the sort of systems series of like systems and CPTSD, we've got a lot of opinions about things like diet culture, gender oppression, queerness, and so on, religious abuse. Um, if you want to hear it, they're coming, folks. Um, and so speaking, and that was the thing that I, I wanted to, to add if community feels unavailable to you right now, find your way to the CPTSD podcast's Facebook page and let's build one there. That sounds like a beautiful place to start. Thank you, Nikki. We're so happy you came today. It was a wonderful dialogue, wonderful to be here. And I can appreciate each of your perspectives on a, a larger issue that's going to take us time to dismantle. But as long as we are all putting forth the effort to do so, we're going to get there eventually. Thank you for that encouragement. We are going to get there because there are more of us than them. And yeah. What we're waking up to. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And from a side, from like a, an evolutionary perspective, we're still evolving. We have places yes. to go folks as a human as, so the other thing that, um, the last thing I'm like the other thing I could do that for hours. The last thing, um, I heard it said that because of how developed we are today as a species, our evolution is no longer biological. It's conscious. Mm -hmm. You get to consciously evolve. Yeah. That's so cool. It, it is. is. <laughs> what a treat. Yeah. Thank you all so much for having me. This was wonderful. Yeah. We're so good. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. That's it. Um, if you liked what you heard, you can like, you can subscribe, leave a review. Um, if this totally flipped your lid, you're going to be all right. We can, we're going to keep talking about all the ways to get your lid back flipped. Um, and then Nikki, if people want to find you, where can they find you? Yeah. So um, my practice website, it's www.solace, S-O-L-A-C-E, Chateau, C-H-A-T-E-A-U.com. All right. Um, another great conversation. Thank you guys so much. And that is, that's a wrap for us. Bye.